Welcome everyone to Couch Potato Diary. Happy Thursday. My name is Peter Klein. Thank you very much for tuning in today. We have some breaking news from the hockey world as the Toronto Maple Leafs have fired head coach Sheldon Keefe. Uh, we will also be looking at the playoff games from last night in both the NHL and the NBA. So we have a lot to get to. Let's get to it and start talking some hockey. The Toronto Maple Leafs uh, have announced that they have uh, let go of head coach Sheldon Keefe after a lengthy time with the organization. Um, the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, announcing today that Keefe has been relieved of his duties with the organization and the search for a new head coach begins. This was absolutely the move that the Leafs had to make. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. This was the move the Leafs had to, that the Leafs had to make. This was not the move that fixes the Leafs. This is not this 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 cannot be the big move of the offseason for the Toronto Maple Leafs. It can be a big move for the Toronto Maple Leafs, but this team did not lose in the first round to the Boston Bruins, in the second round to the um, Tampa Bay Lightning, in the first round to Columbus and Montreal and Tampa Bay and Washington and Boston and all those guys. They they, they didn't lose every time with Sheldon Keefe simply because of Sheldon Keefe. But I don't think he did enough to to help things. And honest, obviously, when he is talking to the media and discussing different things, it, it, you're you're not getting 100% of everything, obviously. Um, but when he's going to the media, well, you know, the effort's there. It's like, yeah, we don't... Leaf fans don't need to hear about the effort. Um, they, they need to know why this team is losing. Honestly, effort would be more comforting. If the effort wasn't there, then you, you can fix effort. You can't fix uh, skill and lack of cohesion, and it just, there, there was never, it, it just felt like any time uh, the, the other team would make an adjustment or anything like that, Keefe was a little bit slow on the uptick. And look, I, I think Sheldon Keefe is a pretty good coach. Um, he's got this team to over 100 points a bunch of times, but to to get this team over the hump, he just isn't the right guy for this group. I don't know if the message wore thin or what it was, but this never really worked. And I do think he was put in a very difficult position because this is obviously now a core that just doesn't work together in a way that is successful in the Stanley Cup playoffs. And there were a number of times where you could tell he was really frustrated with things and he would call out a Marner or a Matthews or a Nylander in the media and then have to come back with his tail between his legs and be like, I'm sorry. Um, and... I I don't think that that earned him the respect in that room, and I I don't I don't think it get, put him in the best possible situation. So this is a move that they had to make. If he is just the scapegoat, then that is not enough, and Toronto was just going to back going to be back into what they needed to or going to go back into to what they have been for the last little while. Sorry, and that is a bitter bitter disappointment of a hockey team. The roster needs to be changed, but. This is honestly a coach that survived longer than he probably would have under any other general manager. And that is, uh, I guess, a credit to his relationship building. But th this was this was a move that had to be made. And it was probably a couple of years too late to get this thing back on the tracks for the Maple Leafs. But Dubas' entire reputation was kind of banking on Sheldon Keefe being that guy. And it didn't really work. And now the Leafs are in a really difficult spot. This is probably the most important coaching hire the Toronto Maple Leafs are going to make in a really, really, really long time. Because I would I would guess that a major roster move is coming. And now this coach is going to be tasked with finally trying to get this team over that hump. And if this one doesn't work, I don't know what the answer is. And I think that is a bigger picture question here with the Toronto Maple Leafs. The thought is, okay, yeah, you go out, you trade Marner, let's say. You bring in a couple pieces with that money, you spread the depth out, and this team's going to be golden. But what if it isn't? What if this doesn't work? Like, what, what, like what we're talking about making a big move here, what happens if it still doesn't work? Like, where, how, how far does it go before you have to make real drastic changes? So... This is, that honestly, that might have been one of the reasons why Toronto didn't make those moves in the first place, is like, okay, well, yeah, but if we if we break glass in case of emergency, and that still doesn't put the, put the fire out, 
what do we do then? But Toronto is definitely in a spot where they absolutely have to be making these moves. Uh, shifting gears now to the teams that are still in the playoffs. The Vancouver Canucks with an incredible come-from-behind 5-4 win over the Edmonton Oilers last night. And full marks to Vancouver. Um, I, I thought you saw the concerns that people had, specifically me, in the uh, beginning part of this game. Defensively, they were in shambles. Um, some just atrocious turnovers, some horrendous defensive zone play and coverage, and that led to Edmonton getting a quick start. Also, I get the Hyman shot was deflected by Myers. Seelovs needs to have that one. Um, he was fine, um, but he there was a couple of times where you could see this was a big moment for him. And so you have the concerns like, man, and I, I even said watching this game, like to start, it was everything at Edmonton's pace, and it felt like, Vancouver was just white knuckled, like, oh my gosh. And Edmonton was out for just like, yeah, no, this is, this is what we do. Um, and then slowly that started to shift into Vancouver's favor a little bit. And they, they, they started to get going. And I think this is where the experience edge for Edmonton came into play is that they had quite a few days off, but they knew what to expect. They came in and they, they really took it to Vancouver. But as this game went on, Vancouver got their legs back after a, a lengthy layoff, and they're like, hey, no, we're we're pretty good at this. And they started to dictate the pace, and they started to control this game in a way that was more favorable to them. And that was not something I was anticipating this team being able to do. I thought this game was going to be at Edmonton's pace, and Vancouver was going to have to catch up. And there were certain times where they did have to kind of catch up, and they did. And so that is, I think, a real boost for this Vancouver team to be able to hang in there with Edmonton during Edmonton while this game was being played in the Oilers' style and then be able to hard turn this thing back into the way they wanted to. That is some really, really great stuff. And again, it is the depth pieces for Vancouver that come up. Pedersen was okay. Um, and you get Besser and Miller combining on a goal, but it's Garland getting a breakaway. It's Joshua going to the front of the goal. It's Lindholm. I thought this was probably Lindholm's best game in the playoffs. Um, throwing one in front, and it ends up banking in. It's those type of players who stepped up for the Vancouver Canucks and gave them this lead in this series. So that is that 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 is it is just such a huge boost to this Vancouver Canuck team to be able to have that and to be able to now pocket that victory up one nothing in this series. Continuing on with our look at the Stanley Cup playoffs, it was the Florida Panthers getting back in their series with the Boston Bruins with a 6-1 win, and this was more like it, more of what I was expecting from the Florida Panthers when I, I said at the beginning of the series that I don't know how Boston would win, and then they won. Uh, this was more the Florida Panthers controlling things and picking up what they, they needed to. But credit the Boston Bruins. They get off to the good start with a one nothing lead, good back check from Coyle, and you're looking at it like, oh my gosh, another Florida turnover leads to another Bruins goal, and here we go again. And Bobrovsky, like I, I was thinking, because uh, I, I watched this one after I knew what happened, I was like, okay, maybe Bobrovsky kind of settled down a little bit. Nope. Straight whiffs on one that hits the post, kicks a huge rebound out that they, they just happened to not put in. Um, I, I don't think he was overly sharp, but this was some of the, the players for the Florida Panthers stepping up and coming up in, in big time ways. And there was, it was a weird game because it starts off with a lot of special teams. So it's tough to really get it into that flow, but once Florida got going, and we saw this in the Tampa Bay series, once this Florida Panthers team gets rolling, it is really, really difficult to stop them, and they can play with such pace, and such power, and they have scoring up and down their lineup, and they have so many different ways that they can beat you, and then they kind of dragged the Boston Bruins into the fight, and they... I don't think it took Boston out of their game. Like, all the, the rough stuff really starts to pick up once this game kind of gets out of reach. But the Panthers, I thought, sent a message that, look, you guys big-brothered the little kids over there in the Toronto Maple Leafs. We ain't doing that. We, we are going to come back at you and we're going to punch in the mouth. And you can definitely get on them for how they went about that. For sure you can. But this was the Florida Panthers sending a message to the Boston Bruins that, look, we're more talented than you, we're deeper than you, we're faster than you, and that whole thing that you guys think you can do, we can do it better. 
time will tell if that is actually accurate or not, but this was the Florida Panthers really reestablishing what they can do on, uh, I guess, specifically the offensive side of the puck, and I, I thought they played a really, really good last 40 minutes of this game, and even the, the first 20, I, I thought they played pretty well as well, but they really put it on, and Barkov, I, I thought, was the difference maker, and we, we, we have talked in the past, um, at least I have on, on different platforms, about how this is kind of the replacement now for the NHL, for Patrice Bergeron, and I, I thought he was, he was showing why in this game, and that they had a lot of different things that set up the, these chances, but Barkov, with his ability to um, retrieve the puck, whether it's off of the boards, whether it is um, from scrums in front of the net, but his ability to create, to, to steal a basketball term, second chance opportunities for the Florida Panthers really set them up for success in this game, and now Boston is going to have to find a way to to compete with that. It's not the, the, the punching in the face. It's not all of these things. It's how do you win those battles on the boards, and they were able to do that in game one, and they got their ass beat in game two and that is a real reason why they were able to do that and Florida has a really good sense of how teams want to defend them as well you, you see Reinhardt go in so defenders just kind of swarm to him because the guy scored almost 60 goals this season and then oh hey look at this there's a pass open and that dude whose name you can't pronounce just bang the puck into the net and off, off and running they go so I, I thought a master class from the Florida Panthers and what we said going out of, coming out of game one like that's probably the worst game Ekblad's gonna play this series and and that was accurate. He was much better in game two. And it sets up for a, a really, really fun finish. Looking forward to the games tonight, it is the Rangers taking on Carolina. I did the, the thing yesterday talking about how I feel like the Rangers still have a few things they need to iron out. Defensively, this is a team that really struggled against Carolina in that last game. Um, offensively, I, I didn't think they sustained enough offense, um, particularly at the five on five, but their power play is so lethal. So for Carolina tonight, the blood is going to be pumping. That arena is going to be crazy. It is going to be nuts in there. You have to, like, use it, but you have to walk that line. Because if you give this Rangers power play any opportunities, they will ram it down your throat. And that is going to be such a key for Carolina, is keeping this one five on five. Shesterkin was phenomenal in the last game. And uh, another interesting part here is Carolina not going with Anderson. Um, Rob Brindamore saying that he wants to give his his goalie a bit of a breather after playing almost two full games in uh, in game two as that one goes to double overtime. So a very intriguing storyline developing out in Carolina. We will see how they handle it. I think that the Hurricanes do get the job done in this game. Um... I I don't have the highest opinion of Freddie Anderson. You guys know that. And so I thought they were going to win this game with him. And so I, I don't think going to the backup overly changes things too much, in my opinion. And Dallas, Colorado, it's kind of same thing for, for the Dallas Stars. How do you respond now after a heartbreaking loss in Game 2? I think you have to remind yourselves of how you got that 3 nothing lead in instead of how you blew it. Um, but th this is th there is so much talent and so much skill on both of these teams. I, I do think that they are going to be able to bounce back in fine fashion. So that is the story from the NHL. What about the NBA as we had another wild night at the Garden? How do you not love the New York Knicks? I mean, if you're in Indiana or Philadelphia, I, I have a pretty easy answer to that. But aside from that, how do you not love this New York Knickerbocker team? Um, they are the perfect team for New York. They are the perfect team for Tom Thibodeau. As they come out, doesn't matter who's hurt, they come out and just grind away victories. What a series this has been. The Knicks have been, like, they have played, what is it now, eight playoff games, and every one of them has been wildly fascinating <laughs> and really interesting. And uh, have come down to the wire, and there have been people a little bit frustrated with how the officiating has gone in them. But I, I think from a New York Knicks standpoint, this is a team that this fan base has been dying for and has really embraced things. And it all starts with Jalen Brunson. And when he goes down in the second quarter and the Indiana Pacers go on that run to start to pull ahead you're getting a little bit concerned because they have run Brunson into the ground and that's not going to get better over the next little bit. So they, they, they really need 
To, I mean, overall, they need to figure out the, the non-Brunson minutes. And yes, generally, there's only about three of those in a game, but they, they still need to figure that out. Because without him, they got smoked against Philly, and they got smoked last night against the Indiana Pacers. But he comes back in and just lights the world on fire. And they did what um, we, we talked about Denver doing in the last series and what they've been unable to do in this series, distributing the ball getting the other guys involved. And OG Ananobi had a really great game until he got hurt. And we'll talk about that in a second. Josh Hart continues to step up. DiVincenzo comes up with some big plays. And now Hartenstein um, is out there throwing it down. And he has picked his game up offensively. So I, I thought one thing the Knicks did well in this game, and part of it was by necessity, but the other guys really got going for New York. And I understand Rick Carlisle is rather upset about the officiating. And... Game one, you certainly have a case. Uh, game two, I, I just, I don't think so. I I think that that is residual frustration carrying over from game one into game two, and he is just being boo-boo faced about it. So I, I think that this is a, th this is a complaint that, like, it, it's to get his team going, and it's that no one believes in us. Everyone hates us. They're chanting, fuck you to our legend that's sitting over there. Um, so I, I don't think that this is a, um, a, a real legitimate concern. I think this is him getting his team fired up, but he should be getting his team fired up to have some perimeter defense because they have none right now. It is so easy for the Knicks to get to the rim and like their guys can shoot. OG can hit from three. Um, Brunson can hit from three. DiVincenzo can hit from three. Hart can hit from three, but they like getting to the rim. And that means they're really liking how things have been going against this Pacer team because they have been able to get to the rim rather consistently over the, the at least in game two, they were able to. And that has really broken things down for the Pacers. And they, I mean, they haven't been able to figure it out all, all year. The one guy who can maybe get in the way a little bit is Halliburton. And he is very obviously limited in what he can do. And so the Knicks are just dicing them up and getting to that painted area whenever they need. And then you're getting Brunson hitting floaters, you're getting everyone throwing down monster dunks, and it's then creating opportunities to kick the ball out and create those three-point shots. So that is something the Pacers need to work on 100%. But um, for the Knicks, this is a really challenging time now because OG Ananobi leaves this game with a hamstring injury, and he was ballin'. Um, his help defense is exceptional. He, he's come up with, he came up with a couple of big blocks on Embiid from the, the help side. Um, he has come up with a couple of big blocks in this series for, through his help defense. He has been everything they have needed him to be with health, uh, with his help defense. And then it's creating offensive opportunities. And then he's thriving in those as well. Um, again, no one, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm very choked up about it. no one staying in front of him. Um, his shooting has always been a weapon for this team and that has continued and that has really that was a real spark for them and if he's going to miss some time and odds are he will that's going to be really really challenging to replace that both offensively and defensively like offensively they, they have no one left um <laughs> they're already missing Randall they're already missing Bogdanovich Burks just hasn't played at all they really only trusted six guys to begin with. And now it feels literally like if you wanted to tell me coming out of game three that their starters just played 48 minutes the whole way, maybe Mitchell Robinson came in for a second. I I would not be surprised at all. So the Pacers, I, I think their pace, nah, um, they're really going to put the foot on the gas in game three and really try to wear this Knicks team down. And it, it could really work given how much Tibbs wants to play these guys. Um, and they are going all out this whole time, but I, I do think that this is the opportunity now for the Pacers. Like, without OG, it's going to be tough for, for the Knicks, just because they don't trust anyone else on that team. Like, they, they have bench players who haven't played in, like, three months. Um, so th this is, this is the Pacers' time, and it, it really does open up the door for them in this series to, to really battle their way back. So, it, it is, oh, what a series it's been, though. Right, like Brunson taking a step up. Hart has turned himself into, oh, that's the kind of guy you win with. Um, he has really figured out his role. And it is, like I said before, the perfect team for New York. And I will admit a bias. Like, I know he said, well, small, small market teams need to have a chance to win too. And again, like I, they are, Toronto is not a small market by any stretch of the imagination. But because of the Canadian dollar, they're considered a small market team. So I love it. 
when Canadian teams, or uh, well, when small market teams have a chance to thrive. S but, god damn is it fun when the Garden's bumping, and when the Knicks are relevant, and we could get Boston against New York in the NBA, or in the, the Eastern Conference Finals. Oh, it's so much fun. <laughs> and on the other hand, like on the other side, I'm excited too if we get Minnesota against Oklahoma City. I just love good basketball, but I really love good basketball when it's being played at Madison Square Garden. All right, that's going to do it for the show. Um, obviously a little disjointed uh, with this one today. Um, I did the uh, peek behind the curtain a little bit. Uh, did the, the, the first part of this at about nine o'clock this morning and then got called away to, to help out with some stuff. Um, d uh, nothing bad at all, uh, but just got called away, had to go help with a few things and then came back here around 1.30 and uh, re recorded the rest of this show for you guys. So a little all over the place, but thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, you can follow me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. I'm at primetimeklein, twitch.tv slash primetimepk. And you can email this show, couchpotatodiary at yahoo.com. Make sure if you're listening, you subscribe and leave a review. If you are watching, make sure you subscribe, hit that like button and leave a comment. I can't be batting a thousand with things that you like on this thing. So let me know. And I will talk to all of you on a fighting Friday tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody.